Uh, good. Uh, so today's uh, lecture uh, is going to be by uh, Eric Beckers. He's a tenure track uh, assistant professor at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, and he's going to talk a lot about uh, group convolutions. And uh, uh, it's slightly different from what the program said, uh, but I think that was because it was a mistake on our part that it was not updated. Uh, but I think, uh, except one final thing, just a reminder that the videos are again going to be recorded. And then if you don't want to feature the video, so uh, try to, you know, post the questions on the chat or, or just, you know, after the recording has stopped, uh, you know, you can just ask us the questions. All right. So over to you, Eric. Yeah, thank um, you, Alan. Okay. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, yeah, for those of you who came here because of the title uh, in the program on graph uh, neural network, you won't be disappointed because group convolution neural networks are much better and nicer, and you can combine them. So, um, now I, I'm a researcher in uh, geometric deep learning, and I focus specifically on well, not specifically, but a lot on the equivariant aspect of deep learning. And this has been covered uh, partly in the, the lectures uh, yesterday, and this will be full on about group theory in, in deep learning. Um, so, the purpose of these sessions, because these are three hour sessions, uh, is to really get you familiar with uh, the mathematical concepts that lie behind group equivalent deep learning. And there will be plenty of examples of how this translates to deep learning architecture. Uh, but the purpose is, and uh, there's a lot of uh, math behind equivalent deep learning. And uh, for non mathematicians, this may seem intimidating at first, but hopefully, after this talk, you are comfortable to run along with these uh, geometric deep learning methods. Um, so the structure is going to be as follows. So we'll split this in three parts. We have breaks in the, in the meantime. Uh, the first part will be really an introduction to group convolutions. Uh, so to start with the motivation, I introduced the very basics of group theory that you need for working with group convolutional networks, show how to build them, and then some applications. And this part will really be, let's say, a promotional talk for group convolutions. And I hope it excites you to also use them in your applications, as I think everybody should, uh, uh, because group equivalence that's really a property that you want, would want in your networks. And then the second part is really a motivation or all about the statement group convolutions are all you need. And here, this is going to be a bit a more formal uh, part of the, the lecture where I'm again going to look at the group theoretical background and show that we can come up with a theorem that states if you want to build neural networks with uh, linear layers between feature maps or vector spaces and you want this uh, linear map to be equivalent then the only option that you have are the group convolutions so that is really a strong statement that if you want group equivalence in your uh, systems well then you should use uh, group convolutions or maybe nonlinear adaptations uh, of them so it will be a bit of deeper dive into representation theory, homogeneous spaces, some concepts from group theory. Um, and this, this theorem, which I'm going to explain, also clearly characterizes different type of, of equivalent uh, layers, which you can use to build uh, deep learning methods. Uh, with. And then uh, finally, uh, I'll, in part three, I'll cover a class of group convolutions a method called uh, steerable group convolutions. Uh, this relates to uh, physics uh, in the sense of, uh, maybe some of you are familiar with spherical harmonics functions and representation theory on them. Uh, you can apply them also to build uh, neural architectures. Uh, and okay, so that will be an even deeper dive into group theory, but it all has very clear implications uh, in, in computer science. And I hope I can make that clear in these, uh, these lectures. So in preparation for this, I spent last week a lot of time writing these uh, lecture notes. So these accompany the, these uh, slides. So I'm going to talk for the next slightly less than three hours. Um, in these lecture notes, you find all the background. It's, I must admit, it's still a work in progress. So there may be several typos and, and some proofs, for example, are left as exercises, which is fun, of course, also to do. Uh, but basically, you everything I explained will also be in this lecture note, but in, bit, in a bit more detail. And then later on in the, the break, I will also post some collab notebook exercises to get you started uh, with these kind of uh, methods. Um, yeah, so let's start. 
uh, in this part, I'll talk about why do we want a uh, group equivalent models and then approach group theoretical, uh, this group theoretical viewpoint from a recognition by components. And then I'll go to some experimental examples. Another note I want to make is that please interrupt me if, if there are any questions, um, because this, uh, otherwise, you know, uh, I'm making here a monologue and it's nice that I have some interactions that, such that I know that you're, we're on the, the same page. So first of all, motivation from why group equivalence or inverse is important. I think it's clear, like, if you have classification tasks, such as the classification of, of cells, so um, this is a, a part of a histopathology image, and we want to recognize it as either healthy or pathological. Then you want, of course, if I rotate this patch, that the label stays the same, right? So this is an invariant uh, problem. And currently, neural networks do not, or like the classical ones, do not guarantee this. They cannot provide a guarantee that this is the case. It might even say the exact opposite. So this is clearly undesirable uh, behavior. Now, a common approach to this is data augmentation. So what you would do, you just make rotated copies of these training samples uh, with transformations to which you want the system to be invariant. And then you just let the neural network figure out um, that these samples are all the same, which is a bit a silly construction, of course, because if you know that these are the same, why not build these priors into the neural network? So that is what we're going to do. If we have such geometric constraints on our networks, then we build, build them in the network so that we can have actual guarantees um, that these methods uh, will be invariant. Because these data augmentations, they rely on the fact that the neural network have to learn how to be invariant, so, and therefore there's still no guarantee. Um, because you know you can get stuck in local optima, these kind of things. Um, another thing is that valuable network capacity is spent on learning these, ge these geometric properties, right? So these networks are parameterized by all these weights, and they need to learn representations. And it's a ways to let them also learn uh, geometric structure. Finally, this also would lead to a lot of redundancy in uh, the neural network in the feature representations. I don't know if you ever built neural network, convolutional neural network architectures and visualize the first set of convolution filters, for example, or in these layers, what you would see is often rotated copies of the same feature, like an edge detector, one filter described an edge detector in this orientation, another filter in that orientation. So there's a lot of redundancy in representation power. Um, so what we're going to do is solve this via group convolutional neural networks. Okay, so that's one part of things. We want to <coughs> guarantee Another thing is what we already know that convolutional networks are translation equivalent, meaning that if the input translates, the output uh, translates accordingly. And this is important for two reasons. Uh, first of all, um, it makes sure that all information stays within the network, even if the image is shifted a little bit. Like I could still detect this uh, person over here uh, were to be skating over here uh, because the output would translate accordingly. Um, and the other thing is this equivalence properly property is precisely the underlying mechanisms that makes CNNs and computer vision so successful because then you can apply weight sharing. If um, information just shifts in the data, you can also just localize your convolution filter, detect a pattern at this location, and then try to detect the same pattern at another location. So event ensures that you can uh, perform weight sharing. Now, we also know that CNNs are not rotation event. So if I rotate this image, it's a bit maybe unclear, but these features, you call the code that they completely change. So it's unstable. So if you have a detector based on some filters, um, yeah, if you rotate the input, then you get a completely different output. And um, so you cannot rely on that. Okay, so the importance of equivariance is that no information is lost when the input is transformed, and we can guarantee stability to uh, transformations, both local and global. Um, I, I'll make a point about this local versus global aspect uh, later on, but yeah, okay, that, that, that's it for now. What we do with group convolutions, we extend this notion of equivariance beyond translations, 
and but also make uh, these networks uh, equivalent to also rotations or scaling or other kind of transformations in a group. This provides geometric guarantees such as invariance and equivariance, and it increases uh, uh, the option for weight sharing because now I can detect a feature not only over positions but also over rotations. For example, an edge detector you want to uh, share the, the the edge detecting filter over all locations and orientation on the image. Then a final important remark um, is that GCNNs are not only relevant for invariant problems, uh, because even if your problems, such as in computer vision often, um, are not fully invariant, with that I mean there's a clear horizon, people are skating in upright positions uh, typically. Um, so this is not an invariant problem, but still equivariance uh, helps a lot because of this weight sharing and because uh, well, we have this guaranteed stability. An edge, you still want the lower level features, for example, to be detected with all possible transformations to build higher level uh, representations. And I think it's a clear motivation, but it's also experimentally shown that even if you have non invariance problems, group convolutional networks really outperform the, the usual uh, networks. Now, a second motivation comes from this concept from the psychology of vision of recognition by components that were tend to build objects from lower level features in a hierarchical manner. And um, this is an example from medical image data, for example, or medical data, where we can, this is a heart, and you can construct basically this, this heart or different structures through it, but just working with low level features, let's say local surfaces. And these surfaces, they can appear in all possible rotations in the data, they can be scaled. Um, so um, that's already group symmetry there that we have features that appear in all transformation in the group. But then you can build higher uh, level features, for example, tubes with them by placing them in a relative configuration of transformation. So yeah, these surfaces are placed in a particular configuration as to make it look like a tube. And then these tubes themselves, they also appear in all these vessels, they appear in all possible translations, rotations, and scales. Um, so that's again the symmetry, and most importantly, uh, the relative positioning of these surfaces stays intact. Uh, and so you can go on and build, for example, bifurcations, which is the placement of these tubes, three tubes in a relative position and angle relative to each other. Um, so and that is what group theory is all about. It's all about relative transformation, so relative placements of elements. And if I want to know what this tube looks like and at every other point in space, I just transform it via the group action, uh, as we will see uh, soon. Yeah, okay, so this is also the rationale behind a capsule nets for those into deep learning. Uh, so this is um, a term I think coined by uh, Jeffrey Hinton, and it also tries to build on this idea of uh, part whole relations that objects are built of uh, smaller parts. Yeah, so now we're to the point uh, <coughs> that we can talk about group theory. So we have a motivation in place, and let's let's go to the basics again. So just to remind those who learned about it uh, or introduced to those that don't know it yet, a group has this definition. It, it is a set of elements, G, and it's equipped with a group product. So the group product is a binary operator that takes two elements from this set and combines it into um, a new one. So the product of these two group elements is again in the group. So that's the closure property. And then you have all these uh, things, uh, most importantly, the identity element. So that doesn't, if you multiply this identity with another one, nothing happens and there's an inverse that undoes and undoes this uh, group product. Um, from, okay, so, so this is really just a construction for um, yeah, a, a particular algebra. Maybe Question. it would be worthwhile to point out to those working with images that, for instance, rotations with this, scaling with this, translation with this. Yeah. So this is not something weird in. No, so it's no magic, and I'll show some. Uh, examples in a minute, but it's like this: uh, you, you were, you're familiar with vector spaces, for example. So vector spaces also have a particular definition. Uh, so you have vector addition, you have scalar multiplication. So there are certain rules that define a vector space. 
and how to compute the factors, how to add them and stuff. And so it's the construction of a group. So it's a set and there's some rules to compute with group, uh, group elements. And more specifically, you do that via the group product and the group inverse. Is that a question in a bit? It's a binary operator because it takes a group element on the left and a group element on the right. So it, it takes two inputs, namely, uh, for example, here, a group element G and a group element H, and it spits out another uh, group element. Okay, so this is just takes two inputs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's make it concrete. So this is a very simple group that you're probably all familiar with. That's namely the translation group. Uh, which consists of the set of all possible translations, which I can represent with uh, 2D vectors. And the group product and group inverse are simply um, addition of the vector and uh, negation of the, this vector. Um, so, so it's a group via the, the sum summation as the group product. And I'm going to use this notation. I'm going to represent translation with G because now I'm treating it as a group. And when I treat it as a vector, I, I write the bold space. And I made this distinction, like I write it like this, because even though it's trivial, uh, we will see later on that, for example, the group product is not a product is not defined for vectors uh, as such. And also, what is the inverse of a, a vector? I cannot write that. So now I'm talking about group elements. For group elements, I only have a group product and a group inverse. So that's why I'm with this slight distinction. So the idea is that these group elements, you can think of them as describing the parameters for a transformation. So it's like this, a, a translation, for example, is represented by this group element G. If I then apply another translation by G prime, um, sorry, the order is different. It should be first application of, yeah, of G. I first apply G and then G prime. But the thing is this group product, uh, in this case, it doesn't matter because the, the group commutes. Um, but the idea is this group product describes the netto operation of applying uh, two group uh, transformation right after each other, right? So that's how you can think of the group product. If I have two parameterizations of a transformation, the group product tells me how to combine them into a single transformation. Okay, so let's look at a more uh, interesting group the group of rotor translations. So this group consists of uh, the space of translations, R2, and rotations, which I can represent with rotation angles um, in, uh, on the ring. So technically, it's, it's a symmetric product of translations and rotations. I uh, will define semi-direct in, in a minute, but it's a combination of rotations and translations. Um, okay, so that's the set. So it consists of translation and rotations. Then I have to define the product. Uh, the product combines a translation and a rotation with another translation and rotation in the following way. And this is what you may have seen um, uh, maybe in other uh, contexts. If I uh, wrote a translate a vector, uh, it happens like this. So I have the rotation acting on the spatial part. And if an object has an orientation, this orientation is, is, is rotated accordingly. So visually, it would look like this, this G, represents a rotor translation. So it translates and rotates this object. And if I then again, I wrote it translated by another transformation, well, you update its position and its rotation, its, its angle uh, that it has. So again, the group product describes if I have two such transformations, apply them one after another, then this is uh, the netto operator operation that I get. And I hope now it's clear that I can no longer stick with uh, concepts such as vector spaces or uh, matrix constructions, because now my group elements are neither vectors or matrices, they're a combination of two. So how can I, com I cannot just add them or subtract them. So I really need the definition of a group product in order to make these computations a bit more uh, feasible, because now G dot G prime simply represents this combined uh, transformation. Secondly, we need a group structure because um, there's this interaction of this part, the rotation part, with the spatial part. So these two, these matrices mix with the vectors. So as they're also, therefore, we need some algebraic structure that tells us how to combine uh, these transformations. And the fact that the rotation acts on the spatial part 
a means that we call it a semi-direct uh, product group. Yeah, okay, and this is then, then another example of translations plus scaling. So I can represent scaling with a positive uh, value. Um, so scaling X on the spatial part, just by scaling this translation and then adding the translations. Okay, so this is again a group product, and this is how the group inverse is defined that undoes um, this transformation. Um, yeah, small remark here is that um, group, this is a particular representation of the group of translations and scalings, right? So I can represent it with the translation factor and the scale factor factor. Uh, but I could also represent the group as a matrix, uh, for example, with uh, identity on this block. So that scales uh, position vectors and here a translation factor. And then you will see that if I apply this matrix with another matrix of that form, I again obtain a matrix of that particular form and hence it, it's a group. Um, yeah, so let's see what's going on. Yeah, okay, so now we're going to relate this to this recognition by component concept. So, okay, the, we learned that the group, like a group is this algebraic construction, and now we're going to use it to, to describe representations. So in a deep learning setting, it's all about learning representations that describe some object, some, some feature. For example, we want to have a face detector. And now we can think actually of these, these transformations as describing poses of an object. For example, a face can be described with a set of line segments that describe the contour of the face. You have the eyes, which I'm going to describe with group elements, right? Because a group element has a position and a rotation or an orientation in the 2D case that can represent with theta. So a group element can be represented as an arrow. So then I can define a phase, let's say, as a particular configuration of positions and orientations relative to the nose, for example. I want to see the eyes you know, in line directions like this and the contour of the face like this. Now, if I want to know what this representation looks like at any other uh, pose, let's say the nose now points in this direction, then the, the eyes and the contour should roto translate accordingly. Now, since we have defined this group product in this way, we can obtain this entire set of points directly by just multiplying everything on the left hand side. Um, and that's the elegant thing of, of group theory is that once you have a representation at the origin, I know exactly what it looks like at every other possible transformation by just multiplying everything on the left with the group uh, product. So, okay, so that's intuitively maybe what, how we can think of using group, uh, the group structure in neural networks. Um, but the thing is, what I just described is describing a feature as a set of points or group elements, but we have to compute with them. Uh, we have, for example, images uh, to work with a signal data. So actually we want to represent uh, not a feature as a set of points, but maybe as a function. Yeah, so this is a collection of poses, but we want to represent it as a function on the group. So which assigns to every possible translation or relative position, a weight that says, okay, if I want to build a face detector, I want to see an eye at this position and at this position with a certain weight. So, okay, this is sort of the parallel we're assigning weights to relative poses. This one transforms by the group product, as we just uh, saw. And this one transforms by the group representations. Because remember, so far we only have defined a group product, and the group product tells us how to combine elements within this group, but it doesn't say anything how it acts upon other type of objects. And for that, we need a notion of representations. So really, G are parameters of a transformations, but they're not a transformations themselves. They represent a transformation. So uh, a representation. Um, on the space of images, actually, so it, it is a linear operator, LG. So it's an operator, a transformation that is parameterized by these group elements. And it's parameterized and defined in such a way um, that it follows the group structure as follows. So if I apply this transformation once, LG, I apply 
another transformation to this, then the netto transformation is given by the parameters that are obtained by the group product of these uh, two uh, uh, group elements. So you see it follows the group structure, right? So transformation one, transformation two, um, so, and this netto transformation is described by its group product. So, okay, again, this is the basic of, basics of, of group theory uh, that everything relies on this group product. Yeah, as an example, you may have seen this before. Like, if you have a function f, um, I always write L2, so meaning that these functions are square integral functions on some domain, in this case, R2. I need the square integrality for working with inner products and defining convolutions and stuff, but that's not important. This is really an indicator of a space of functions that live on a particular domain. And now we have a group of rotor translations, and then we can define, this is what you call the left regular representation, which is the representations that transforms such functions simply by letting the group act on its domain. Um, and so this is really the, the standard format for defining such a left regular representation. It is the group that acts upon the domain on the left-hand side. So that's why you call the left regular representation. Um, yeah, okay. So it's a bit, it's a duality that you see over here. So we have a group acting on the, the function, which means I have to apply the inverse of the group on the domain. And in the group, case of rotor translation, it's explicitly written as such. Yeah, but you miss the parenthesis. Sorry? Oh, you miss the parenthesis or two. Um, I miss, do you think it should be parentheses here? Yes. Uh, I don't I think do. so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Check the lecture notes. <laughs> no, I, th I think it's. Uh, I think it's like this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> From your notification. Yeah. No. Yeah, I know. I think it's it's correct, but um, yeah, okay. Be sure always double check things uh, yourself. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. But, okay. The main point is indeed. Um, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. There should be parentheses yeah. there. <laughs> no, no, you're absolutely right. This is uh, it's a bit silly uh, because it's like okay, you rotate the object and then translate it. Uh, and, and we'll see that actually in a minute uh, when when we go to. Okay. This is incorrect. Uh, thanks for pointing this out. And then one of the slides later on, we will see that actually, since the group of rotor translations can be split in a rotation part and a translation part, you'll see that uh, the this, this subgroup part is always applied first and then followed by a translation. Um, yeah, so oh, my apologies uh, for this. Awesome. Do you think that you can make like an intuitive interpretation of the definitions we just made for those students for whom most of those signs are new? You know, what is their representation and what is the left regular representation yeah. without using math terms? Is that possible? I think so. Yeah. Um, and it all fall, forms, falls under the umbrella of an action. So we saw the group, the group product, that's the core structure of the group. And then the, you have notions of an action of the group on other type of objects. So initially the group product, we only know how to combine group elements, but we can also apply the group to other type of uh, spaces, vector spaces. For example, um, when I apply the group structure to function to transform functions, for example, I often call it a, rec uh, a representation. When I apply the group action the group structure to vectors on RD, I usually call it an action. The action is a general term that basically describes the group transforms another object other than a group. Um, for specific cases, such as functions, we will call it a representation. And, and usually on RD, we still call it just an action of the group on RD. Um, then, uh, so, and it also means since it follows the group structure, uh, there's not necessarily a need to use different symbols uh, for this. I could just say G acts on another group element, and this is just a group product. Or I can say G acts on a function, and then this is understood to be the transformation LG, uh, or G acts on a vector. And you know, you see on the right hand side, we recognize, hey, this is something different than the group element. Okay, then this should represent an action. 
And now, as for the left right representation, since we have uh, a function on some domain X, and we know how the group X on the domain via the action on RD, for example, in, in this case, then this induces a represent, uh, the left regular representations on these functions as follows. So you see uh, the representation or this action on functions is induced by the action of the group on the domain. Um, yeah, so that's a bit on terminology. Um, yeah, visualized here. So group elements are transformed like this, functions are transformed like that. And the action is like we have a point in, in let's say R2, I can translate and rotate it. And this brings me to another point in this case. <clears throat> um, it might be a minor question, but uh, you show these uh, smile faces now as pixelated. So, is it actually an image with pixels? Because then, if you I rotate see. it a bit and then rotate it a bit more, yeah. will that be the same as doing the rotation in one step? Okay, so all most of what I'm talking about is indeed focusing on continuous functions. Uh, and, and the domain of X I will represent it often as indeed the plane R2. And then there's no notions of interpolation or that that's not necessary. It's really as it is. But indeed, if you work with discrete images, then the, this really then represents a finite dimensional vector, right? Because you sampled it on the basis of a, a pixel grid. And you know, in principle, I could just flatten this into one big vector. And I could define a representation on this. Um, but only if, for example, if the group consists of 90 de degree rotations, then um, yeah, I stay on the spectral grid and then the, the, the transformation is exact. Um, so, and the group of 90 degree rotations is again a group, right? Because if I apply a right angle rotation and another right angle notation, I again would have a transformation, one of these four rotations that were in the group. So then it still applies and this will be, let's say, a discrete representation. Um, but the theory is continuous and then implementation wise there's every, actually several options one is to work with Fourier type transforms which I'll discuss in part three and then there's no need for interpolation at all because you represent them in a continuous basis and then you man manipulate the Fourier coefficient uh, but you it could be that you discretize this and then you need to discretize this operator as well yeah. Yeah, and with this in place, we can formalize the notion of equivariance in, in this group theoretical setting. So um, equivariance is basically that if we have an operator, we indicated with phi, which maps from elements in one space to the other. So let's say it maps from 2D images to 2D images again, X is a 2D image, space of 2D image, Y is the space of 2D images. Uh, so phi has some operator phi. Um, and we need the notion of an action. Sorry for using a different symbol again, uh, but this represents the action of the group on the space of uh, Y in this case, um, and this on the space of X. So this means, okay, I can, for example, translate, if I consider a translation group, the action would induce this translation on the image. And equivalence then means, equivalence is a property of an operator um, such that it satisfies this equivalence or commutation diagram. So I can first translate, then apply the operator, or first apply the operator, and then uh, translate. Okay, so that's it. That's the, the formal definition of equivariance. So now we go, so, and that's all you need actually to build group convolutional neural networks, um, or at least understand them from this basic point, uh, point of view. So now I'm going to show that you are already familiar with group convolutions in the form of standard cross correlations. And I just want to, in deep learning literature and actually in many computer vision applications, cross correlations and convolutions, the terminologies are used interchangeably, but technically it's slightly different. So cross correlation can really be seen as, let's say, template matching of a function with another function, where this one is translated uh, and then every, okay, let's just make it explicit. So you can write it in this form, right? So we have uh, the, the convolution of a correlation of a kernel with a function is really just translating the kernel and for every possible translation, you compute the inner product. You see how well it aligns uh, with, with the background signal. And then, well, convolutions are actually 
the same as correlations with with a reflected kernel. Uh, yeah. Okay. So so that's all there is to it, and I might call them convolutions as well uh, at some point, uh, probably. Okay. So this is what it looks like. So a convolution of a kernel with an underlying signal is really we have this kernel. We translate it, and for every possible translation, we compute this inner product. And you know this inner product that's sort of similarity measure, right? If if it's aligned to underlying vector or signal, then you get a high value. If it's not, you get a low value. So you see, this is maybe a diagonal edge integer. At this point, it picks up. Uh, it's quite similar, so it picks up a high value. And, okay, so this is uh, cross correlations, and you see it's a group convolution in the sense that the kernel is transformed by the representation of the translation. It is also clear that uh, convolutions or cross correlations are translation equivariants. And this directly follows from the fact that this operator is defined in terms of the representation of the translation group. And it's super straightforward to prove that indeed this operator is a translation equivariant because of, uh, well, these representations which define this equivariance property show up here in uh, the definition of uh, the cross correlation operator. It is also uh, clear that generally such convolutions are not uh, equivalent to rotations. So meaning that if I uh, rotate the image, then apply the convolution, the spatial 2D convolution, then I get a different uh, signal as where I to first uh, apply the convolution and then rotate. And I guess it, it's obvious from the, the viewpoint that there's a mismatch between representations uh, to which you want to be equivalent to, and this definition of the correlation operator, because this doesn't do anything with rotations. Okay, so then the first intuitive step forward is just simply replace uh, this representation of the translation group with the representation of the rotor translation. Yeah, and, and that's it. <laughs> so I have explained group convolution, so uh, we can go home now, uh, I guess. Um, now, so this is really the core idea. So, Group correlations or group convolution is template matching with kernels that are transformed on the, under the representation or we call the, the action of the group, the group acting on the space of uh, uh, 2D images in this case. So I'll denote it as this to make it explicit how the group acts or what this representation is. So it's a representation of the group as it do acting on 2D images. Now, the road translation group, as mentioned before, is a semi direct product group. And this now clarifies also the remark by uh, Francois uh, that if uh, you have such a semi direct product group, you can split the transformation in its subgroup part and the translation part or the, the other part. Uh, so that means we first can apply the rotation and then follow it by translation. So that's a really convenient property of uh, these type of groups. This is what you call an affine group. So it consists of a translation part and a part that acts on the space of positions. Um, in some way, it could be a scaling, it could be a rotation or some other uh, distortion. Yeah, so the definition is really, okay, sorry, same mistake again. <laughs> it's a copy paste, or copy paste, I apologize for this. So there should be parentheses over here. Um, so the idea is first apply a rotation and then translate it. So that's what we do over here. We have a kernel and here I see, now I rotate it and then I apply the translation. So from a computational point of view, this is also super easy. Uh, we just apply a rotation to the filter and then translate it over the image. And the result is actually that now we do template matching. Um, oh man, there's another type over here. So this should be a group element over here because we see now we do this template matching for every possible translation and rotation in the group. So this it's a function of the group, right? Because we integrate in this inner product, we integrate over the domain. And you see it over here, right? So we match this filter, and whenever the filter is aligned, they get a high response. So we do this template matching for all positions, x, y, and all uh, rotations, theta. So the output of such a group convolution is a function on the group. It's no longer a function on, uh, 2D, uh, on the 2D plane. Yeah, okay, is this uh, clear? Are there any questions? Then, uh, yeah, then I'll proceed. So you see that this feature map assigns, let's say, affinity values to the underlying signal for every possible position and orientation, and the vertical axis represents rotation. 
And then that's why you also see the spiraling structure, right? Because the contour, the directions of uh, the contour, they change gradually. And so, uh, yeah, okay, the vertical axis uh, encodes for rotation in this particular case. So, could you go back? So the translation is a continuous parameter, but as you show the rotation in, in here, it's discrete. I see, yeah. Isn't it, or is, is that problem? Yeah, okay, so that's an implementation discrepancy. So the underlying group is continuous, and now I'm going to compute with it in a numerical setting. So I have to discretize the group. Um, so now I pick, I know how many I did, let's say 12 rotations. And uh, this actually in the 2D case constitutes also again a group. So this is still a proper group convolution uh, to the discrete group of rotations with uh, discrete translation because so also I'm also translating over integer shapes. Um, yeah, so in the third part of this uh, lectures, I will actually show, uh, I hope I get to it, like a continuous implementation via the Fourier transform on groups. Okay, so now again, using representation theory, we can show that these operators are actually variant. So on the left-hand side, we deal with functions on the 2D plane. So we need a representation of the rotation group on this 2D plane. And on the right-hand side, we have a function on the group, a function on the group. So we need a notion of the representation on, this, on the group. Um, do I define it? No, okay, but uh, I think it's clear. So in the 2D place, it's just a rotation of the plane. In the SC2 case, it's both a rotation of the plane <laughs> and a periodic shift along this extra added axis, right? Because this encodes for orientation. If I change the orientation of my data, everything shifts upwards, right? So let's say, um, so the nose points in a particular direction, it's this particular point. If I rotate it, then it ends up at a different location vertically because the vertical axis encodes for rotation. So these representations, they act on both the spatial part and the subgroup part. Um, I'm not giving a, a definition, like an explicit definition here, but that's the intuition. So we have a representation acting on this space uh, because these leverage representations are defined by the action of the group on the domain of that function. And since S2 is a subgroup of this full group, it is uh, well defined. Okay, so this defines what we call a lifting convolution because it lifts function on the 2D plane to a higher dimensional space in which these features are nicely disentangled based on the transformation in the group. And our subsequent layers follow the exact same structure. It's again a template matching of a kernel but now this kernel is a three-dimensional kernel, right? Because now the underlying signal assigns to every position and translation a value. So also the kernel needs to detect patterns in terms of relative positions and orientations. So the only thing I need to do is define how to transform such a three-dimensional kernel, which is re uh, written as such. There should be parentheses over here again. So it's <laughs> a, a rotor translation of the 2D plane and a periodic shift. So that's what this. Uh, is theta prime minus theta period of shift minus x axis. Okay, um, it, it looks like this. If I have a descriptor of the face, uh, I rotate it. So that's what I pre compute. I rotate it and it gives me uh, a different descriptor which assigns weights to the eye, locations of eyes and such. And then I'm matching it. Uh, so I didn't make an animation of the translation part, but you'll see that um, <coughs> this face has a particular orientation and this one has a particular orientation. And you see whenever this three-dimensional kernel, which detects patterns of local position and orientation is aligned with the underlying signal, you get a high value um, as seen over here. So again, the output of such um, operator is again a function on the group. And this is again a typo, sorry. <laughs> so to better this, so there's a, a lot of types like this, so copy paste, but this should be P, right? So the output should be a function on the group. And not just uh, translations. Um, yeah, again, we can show that this is actually very simply because this operator is defined in terms of these representations. So, what have we seen? So, we see that all these correlation or convolution type operators all follow the exact same form, namely, it's a template matching of a kernel with the underlying signal where you apply some transformation to the kernel. And that's it. If the transformation follows, is coming from a transformation group, then uh, yeah, yeah, you can call it the group convolution. 
Um, so that's what's doing here in the translation case, just translated. In the lifting correlation case, uh, you wrote the translation, which should again be a function of the group. And also in the SC2 case, it's the same. You wrote a translate the kernel. Um, so this is then the general structure of a group convolutional network. You start with a lifting layer, so that gives uh, so you share a pattern over all possible route to translation. You got a group convolution. Oh, right, let, let's go over it. I made it like this. So you have a 2D image uh, with local features. So we have a, a, a convolution filter. I just represent it as some, some directional uh, feature, and I match it with this image, and that gives me a feature map on the group. So activation for oriented structures, that means position and orientation. Then these group convolution kernels describe filters that uh, well detect patterns in terms of local positions and rotations. So uh, that's nice. You can really uh, learn a rich set of representational features. And again, it produces feature maps on the group. And then finally, if we want to be invariant to rotations, then we can decide to project it back to the plane. Uh, so if we're no longer interested in detecting faces at a particular position and a particular orientation, then I could just take do a mean pooling over the subgroup, for example, that can create a 2D image. And these feature maps are then guaranteed to be locally rotationally invariant. So I can detect a phase regardless of its orientation in this image. Same principle applies to other groups. Let's say we can describe a phase in terms of skilled uh, feature factors, uh, let's say blobs. Then um, we have a blob detector and this group convolution kernel and detecting these patterns in terms of relative of, of blobs at relative position and sizes relative to each other. And these descriptors, they transform in a predictable way uh, as to maintain this configuration of positions and scales. So, okay, so we did take a phase at a particular scale at this point and at a particular scale at another point where the vertical axis now encodes for scale. Again, a projection would make this uh, invariant to these uh, transformations. I think now is maybe a good time to, to take a break. I know we want to continue with our time for a break. Uh, let's go for some results where we apply this in practice. So in this topic, we want to do classification of cells as either being normal or mitotic, so pathological cells. And this is an invariant problem because if I rotate it, you want the label to stay the same. So the general construction of such a GCNN is as follows. So we apply a lifting convolution that creates all these feature maps um, on the space of positions and rotations. And then the group convolutions can detect patterns in terms of relative placement of these features uh, in, in terms of, of group transformation. So uh, let's say I want to see an edge uh, here, an edge here and here relative to each other at a particular angle, for example. So that, that's what can be learned in this group conclusion. <laughs> and I do this step by step. Um, now it gets a bit deep learning stuff. Like I'm not going to do padding on, uh, so this is discrete data. And if I apply a convolution filter, it, we want it to fit just in the data. And if I do not do padding, then it shrinks, right? Because I do not want to overlap it. So the outputs become smaller and smaller in the spatial axis. And since the rotation axis is periodic, it stays uh, the same discretization. That's a question? Yeah. I'm a little bit confused about the G-convolution because um, the lifting, you generate, let's say, representations of the group, the, the weights, so to speak, when you play but then, the, uh, the group convolution is again a group convolution uh, in the sense that well, I do template matching with a kernel that is transformed by the action of the group. So it's translated and rotated because I, I could do just a conf 2D, for example, with a three dimensional kernel, uh, but this would do. Okay, now I'm going to can show that, I think. But that you could do it, but then you are only able to detect that particular pattern at that orientation. Um, it's still a 3D pattern that you're matching and you can decide to only match it for translations, but then you only generate a, a function on the translation group because you only applied the translation set to it. So uh, these are three dimensional convolutions, which uh, when moving the vertical axis, apply a rotation to this, this filter. But then I don't understand what the difference is. Maybe it's just the the last slide you showed the ball the break. 
I don't have uh, okay, let, I'll, I'll explain it uh, in the next slide. Okay. And if then it's not clear, then uh, please ask again. Yeah. Awesome. So the way I understand it, you are applying group action to your kernel and then integrating over the entire group in order to get yeah. uh, you know, a, a network that is equivalent to the orientation of the filter, but you know, then you might as well be equivalent with respect to the but what I don't understand is how you implement this. Do you sample the group or do you somehow find an analytical way yeah. to, to perform this? Yeah, so there, there's several options to implement this. So the question is how, how do you do this? Uh, because this is all about continuous settings. And what you often do, and in a 2D case, this is relatively straightforward. You can really discretize the group of rotations with a set of angles. And you say, up. Oh, up front, I'm only going to test my convolution kernel uh, for, let's say, 45 degree rotations. Um, so that so your group then consists only of eight elements, uh, zero rotation, 45, 90 degrees, etc. So the group consists of eight elements. So I would say it's the eight of these rotation layers, which I call it color coded here. Um, uh, let's let's go over that in the, in the next slide. So what this looks like. Uh, because the only way you have to sample your group, why does that work better than sampling your group and doing augmentation during training? Yeah, okay, that's a good point. Um, you could decide to obtain invariance by transforming your input by rotating it and keeping the label fixed. But this is a global transformation, uh, which means um, that I am, I am learning to be invariant to these global rotations of the image. Um, so if I think of this, my, my hands or my arms represent features, a global rotation would move this like this, right? Um, but I won't be able to learn uh, local uh, rotations, right? My arm could still rotate relative to this one. Um, and this is not captured in data augmentation. Data augmentation is a global transformation and group convolutions detect patterns locally under all these transformations because the kernels are localized. And then by stacking these localized convolution filters, we actually obtain global invariance, uh, but they are able to detect patterns in all possible local transformations of the regions. So, so that's what's happening here. So we want this neural network to be equivalent as much as possible, because for one, uh, we can uh, use weight sharing over all these uh, transformations and define features in terms of relative transformations. And um, yeah, I guess that's it. <laughs> so that's really weight sharing. That's the most important thing is stability to this transformation. And then you often end with a projection layer. This could be max pooling or mean pooling or some per permutation invariant operation on this axis of uh, rotations. Uh, because then you project for, for segmentation, for example, you want a function that assigns to every pixel a well, uh, classification. Uh, so you want to make this classification locally invariant to rotations. Um, and for uh, classification, you build, typically build neural network architectures by doing a global uh, pooling. If you have a cat detector, uh, you want to det cat, detect a cat in the image, you don't care where it is in the image, so you pool over all possible locations of this output feature map, which makes it invariant to translations. And that's the same over here. We can pool either over just a rotation axis and that it creates feature maps that are locally invariant to just rotations, or we can decide to do a global pooling to make it really fully invariant to both translations and rotations, meaning that I can detect a cat equally well if it's upside down in an image, for example, regardless of its position. So this is from a, a Mika 2018 paper um, where uh, of actual data. So this is a small patch. <coughs> maybe, yes, maybe a bit small, but the idea so this lifting convolution is parameterized by a 2D convolution kernel because my input is 2D and I do template matching of this filter uh, by translating and rotating. And this is implemented by first applying the rotations to this kernel. So here you have some feature, it's pointing upwards. Um, it corresponds to, I think, this one. <laughs> and then I rotate it. I get a different filter, I rotate it, I get a different filter. So those are these small patches. Those are rotated copies of one and the same filter. And how you apply this rotation, there are several options. So here we did interpolation. Uh, so we say we parameterize the kernel with a discrete set of weights, let's say an array of five by five. If I rotate it with 90 degrees, then this just means a permutation. So I don't need interpolation at all. But if I rotate by 45 degrees, yeah, some pixels fall just between the grid points. 
and therefore I need to do interpolation. And that's what we do here. So we create a set of rotated uh, versions of, let's say, the mother kernel. Then, okay, we have this filter bank, and each filter defines a response via this conf2d operator. And so that's a particular feature map. And we stack them on top of each other, and what we get is a discretized function on the full translation and rotation group. Um, yeah, so this is really an array of pixels x, y, and rotations theta. In this case, uh, one, two, three, four, eight uh, rotations. So this is a three dimensional array that for every position orientation assigns this feature value. Um, yeah, okay, and then in the, the GCONF layers, it's a similar construction, but then um, the convolution kernels are three dimensional and you need to again apply this planar rotation and then a shift along this vertical axis and then apply it for every rotated copy. And it again, constructs a function of positions and orientations. And since we're, since we're not doing any padding on the spatial part, the image becomes smaller and smaller and smaller until we only have a single pixel left, let's say the central pixel, and a response for every possible orientation. That's represented over here. So this is the means that for that central pixel and for every rotation, we have a feature vector, which says in this orientation, my feature vector looks like this, and then at this orientation, my feature vector looks like this. So we can turn this into an invariant descriptor by pooling over this rotation axis. And that just gives me one single vector that represents this entire patch. And by construction, this, this signal or this vector is invariant. It's an invariant representation of my input patch. And you see that if I, for example, consider a particular orientation picked up by this filter, if I rotate the input by the action of the rotation group, um, yeah, I have a rotated image. And the same information is still in the neural network. It's just shifted to different locations in this uh, rotation axis. So there's no loss of information. And these two images are practically identical. Um, so, okay, you apply your group convolution layer, your pooling. So you see this particular feature vector now ends up at a different orientation layer. So it means, well, we have an orient oriented feature. If we're not interested in orientation, we pool over this axis. We get the exact same representation as before. Yeah. So I'm just a bit unsure on how the filter bank is constructed because you have have a filter and then you rotate it seven times so of a gap with group of eight uh, rotations. Yeah. Uh, but these filters are they learned and how many filters do you have? Like how many uh, feature channels, so to say? Uh, if you're yeah, so that, that's the same as before. It's just that the domain is extended with another uh, parameter. So usually let's say an RGB image, you can represent it with, as a three channel feature map, right? And uh, in these networks, you transform this three channel vector in, let's say, uh, a 16 or 64 dimensional feature vector at each location. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the same what we can do. Uh, one kernel describes one channel in the output signal um, because, yeah, you take an inner product and whenever it doesn't match, that just creates a feature value. So if you have 64 copies of such a convolution kernel, you create 64 output feature maps. So that's What's happening here? So this is a visualization of one of such kernels. Yeah, so that's why it indexed with this one. This one actually indexes the output uh, feature channels. Um, so this is the first channel. This one filter generates one feature, uh, feature map, and then the next kernel generates the next feature map. So that principle still applies. Yeah, so we tested this and also compared to data augmentation. So this figure works as follows. So on the horizontal axis, so you see different discretizations of the rotation group. So here it says N is one. It means we do not apply rotations to the filters. And that effectively means that we're doing 2D convolutions. N is two means we do 180 degree rotation. N is four, 90 degree rotations. This is N is eight. And this is with 16 rotations. And so these are all group convolutional networks with different discretizations of this rotation axis. This over here is a 2D convolutional neural network, so N is one. Um, but here we use data augmentation. So we see indeed data, so this one is without data augmentation. So you see data augmentation is helpful because while well, we want invariance and now we learn to be invariant by data augmentation. But then if we guarantee invariance to a subgroup of rotations, uh, namely, for example, only 45 degree rotations, 
then we actually boost performance. And this is not just because we now have a system that is uh, provenly uh, rotationally invariant, but it's also because these GCNNs, they, uh, for one, don't have to spend the learnable parameters on uh, geometric transformations, but also um, they're more, more expressive in the sense that they can represent patterns of orientations and positions relative to each other, whereas the 2D CNNs can only detect spatial patterns. Um, and, this, and then finally, data augmentation is a global transformation and group convolutions uh, detect also local deformations of the data. Okay, so we see with group convolutions, we quite significantly outperform a baseline, 2D based baseline, which is based on data augmentation. Um, so there's no need for data augmentation with transformations that are in the group that you consider. Uh, but for example, color perturbations, that's also a form of data augmentation. That's of course still relevant because that's not covered by uh, the GCN. Uh, this is numerically where we test for how stable is it to rotations. And we actually see some discretization artifacts. So I hope you can see it, but um, green is our 2D baseline. Let's see over here. And then the, the probability of it belonging to a pathological class is uh, visualized with the radius. So it means in one orientation, we have a probability of it being uh, uh, a positive sample. And then in another orientation, we have another probability. And you see that for the red ones, which are the group convolutions, we get circles, which means that the probabilities are stable for every rotation of the input. Uh, but for the 2D case, it's really terrible in the sense that at one point it says, okay, it's a healthy cell. And then another rotation says it's a pathological cells, cell. So this is really showing that, um, yeah, we can solve this instability issue by um, working with group convolution. And these networks are actually trained with data augmentations. And we also show that the method is not perfect. There are some very uh, pathological cases where even our group convolution method is a bit unstable, but it's not as extreme as you, uh, the 2D uh, baseline, for example. Sir, yeah. Can you address why the performance drops when you go into 16? Oh yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good point. Um, it depends on how you implement the chief convolutions. Uh, one thing is all these networks, they have the same number of learnable parameters. So we wanted to allow for a fair comparison. Um, our group convolutions, they work with three-dimensional convolution kernels. So um, if you uh, parameter parameterize it with learnable weights, you have a 3D arrow of, uh, array of learnable weights, whereas in the 2D case, you only have a 2D array of learnable weights. So actually group convolutions, you might say, they need more uh, parameters. Um, <coughs> So what we did in these experiments, we reduced the number of channels, independent features, as to make sure that each network has the same number of learnable parameters. Now, if you discrete, uh, if you discretize the, the subgroup of rotation with more and more elements, you need more and more parameters that describe one convolution kernel, uh, because now these 3D convolution kernels, yeah, they have 16 of these layers. So you need 16 times more parameters than in the 2D case. And since we wanted to make a fair comparison, this means that this one generates 16 times less feature maps. Or actually, uh, it doesn't scale linearly, this piece of paper, but this one has less independent feature maps than this one. So at some point, um, yeah, that, that's a trade off. And the thing is, these convolution kernels do not need such a fine, um, let's say, discretization of the rotation axis, because at some point, there's no point in distinguishing this orientation with a slightly rotation, rotated mm -hmm. version. So you have an overfitting issue here that you parameterize, over parameterize the kernel um, in a way that is not sensible because you do not gain by a deeper discretization. Um, yeah. is, is the number of learnable parameters the most fair comparison? Because I imagine if you go for the compute, yeah. that, that would give an advantage to the non group yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a very good point. Um, so GCNs are more expensive and it, it's roughly scales linearly with the discretization. So this 16 rotations is about 16 times slower. Um, um, but then there's different methods of how to parameterize group convolution kernels because you can do it with a discrete array, um, but you could also parameterize this in a continuous basis. 
um, meaning that I can uh, represent my kernel in a, let's say, eight dimensional basis, but I could still apply 16 rotations to it. And then um, by doing a basis expansion, like a Fourier basis expansion, you have control over the smoothness of these kernels and the amount of learnable parameters. And uh, these methods, they also allow different ways to implement this. And I'm not sure if I get, get to that point, but the last part is on steerable group convolution methods. And there you can have very efficient implementations where you do not explicitly need to discretize the group. You just work with convolution in the Fourier domain, uh, which in some cases is uh, more beneficial. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can, you, can you comment on, on what would happen if we use uh, 45 degrees of computation on this mobility? That it seems like the, the ability of 45 degrees of computation is similar to uh, nice. four groups. Yeah, so um, actually, you want to this method, it consists of 90 degree rotations. Actually, we use 90 degree data augmentations. And this should be as least as good as a data augmentation method. Well, there's some uncertainty here, so we cannot fully uh, verify that. Um, but if you would use this method with 45 degree data augmentations, then it would probably improve because then it learns to compensate for the elements that are not in the group. Uh, yeah, so, so that's the thing. Data augmentations, the transformations that are not in the group are always beneficial or almost always because, well, then the network can learn to uh, compensate for these discretization artifacts, let's say. But remember, if you apply data augmentations of 45 degree to the input, you will introduce also interpolation artifacts in your data, of course. Uh, um, yeah, because you generate artificial data. And this may not always be representative of the true data that you may encounter. Yeah. Talking about this thing about global and local uh, yeah. in right? So if, if we look at that one that makes it error, uh, where it fails, right? Because the, the, the one. Oh, this yeah. one you mean? So yeah. because the, I mean, I interpret your part as saying that if you rotate it, 45 degrees like it, it has it only detects it at, at a very specific yeah point, right yeah so it yeah. sort of suggests to me that this is only in this case it's only about the global orientation right or because otherwise you would expect now, at least some of the local transformations to mm. be to yeah so indeed the, this experience we could only do this with global transformations because that's that's what we can apply to this image. We cannot do this uh, deformable transformations to the input data. That's really. But do you think in this case that it's important with the local transformations? Are, is it just that your model is much better at? at uh, yeah. So. At, uh, I think it's more an issue of representation power. Um, like these data augmentation methods, they deal with global transformations and in principle if you assume that the learning went, worked well then you can can sort of assume that the method is indeed invariant to do this rotation group um, and so will the group convolutions be it's just that the group convolutions they analyze the patterns locally yeah so i struggle a bit with explaining this so i think so the group it's more that you think it's beneficial specifically this local thing this yeah thing. it's because i'm thinking about when you apply it so in what cases does it make sense to go for this local invariance? And when doesn't it make sense? Yeah, it's, so it's more about that. It, it's like if you have an image with uh, patterns, let's say um, local line segments, for example, you want to detect these local line segments, um, maybe in a particular configuration. If you globally rotate the image, yeah, then these line segments. Yeah, they rotate accordingly, whereas may maybe they could also locally rotate. Yeah, I, I don't think I'm making my point uh, <laughs> very strongly with that. Uh, it's more about your experience. Yeah. You sort of have an application where, yeah. where you could really see that. Though, but I think that's maybe the call. Yeah, so I you could think of this maybe as, as applying data augmentation to the filters or something like that instead of. So that, that means you have a sort of data augmentation going on after every layer. Uh, because you, you transform the filters every time. Whereas with data augmentation, you only do a transformation once. Uh, yeah, and that's it. So that, maybe that, that helps. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, Jon? Yeah, 
I mean this one? Yes. Oh, I, I have a different question. Can you replace the sequence of deconvolution with the same? Um, no. Um, okay, yeah, maybe that's something that I didn't say. Is um, in the linear transformation, you can cut in a linear transformation, it, it's again a linear transformation. So in that sense, if I were only apply linear group convolutions, then I might as well do this directly with one group convolution. Um, but in these neural network architectures, they interchange a linear transformation with the nonlinear activation function, for example, point wise application of rather, which turns this into a nonlinear operation. And therefore, you cannot no, no longer describe it with one uh, of such uh, operations. Uh, what's that? So for permutation groups, there are analytical solutions that let you uh, actually make exact equivalent uh, measures. Yeah. Do you have the same for any of these groups that you're looking at? Yes, um, for 90 degree rotations, apply to indeed the discrete, discrete images on a picture grid, you have exact invariance or an equivariance because yeah, there's no interpolation or whatsoever. So if I rotate the data, you get an exact copy of the data it's just permuted. If you do 45 degree rotations, then this is no longer the case. But uh, because you have to yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then you have these aliasing artifacts and all sorts, uh, depending on how you re represent your case. <coughs> but then there's other cases of group convolutions. This is on image data, but you can also perform convolution on, on, on the sphere, on spherical data. For example, in diffusion MRI, if you have process one voxel, which is represented with a function on the sphere, then there are methods to implement exact group convolutions via Fourier transforms uh, using spherical harmonics. Yeah. And, so. yeah. and yeah, and then you can prove exact equivalence. Yeah. Okay, and the final point I wanted to make actually is that GCNs are sample efficient uh, because they do not need to learn a representation for every new rotated instance of the same thing. Um, they're more, much more parameter efficient. And that's what we see over here. Uh, the punchline is here that, um, uh, let's see, okay, <laughs> red was, um, oh, okay, this is an excess of 80 uh, rotations uh, with eight. Uh, with 45 degrees, and again, we get a particular performance. And then this is a 2D baseline. And you see that if I drop the number of uh, data that I use for training to only 25%, uh, that's for example, this blue line over here. So with only 25% of the training data, I get a particular performance. Uh, whereas with 100% of the data for the 2D baseline, I only get this performance. So you can see with even with much less data, you, you already outperform uh, regular CNNs because of this increased weight sharing and you don't have to spend parameters on learning transformations. Okay, this is just this different applications. This is including the, the scaling group. So for computer vision, it might be relevant to detect patterns that are scale invariant. And um, so that's what we did here. We use scale and group convolutions and they outperform a 2D baseline. And on the horizontal axis, different discretizations of the, the scaling axis. Uh, so same results there. And yeah, so that's my, my story basically, GCN as rule. There's a lot of papers, uh, or like, like let's say an increasing number of papers that experimentally prove this, right? So these papers always have a theoretical section saying, okay, the method is equivariant, and then they show it uh, that it is indeed equivariant, and that uh, you get a performance increase like we saw in the, the previous slides. Um, so you can, with GCNs, you can get performance that you cannot get with data augmentation alone, and they have increased sample uh, efficiency. Um, so maybe, and uh, now I'll get there. Um, so this is sort of maybe, maybe a brief history, and as pro it's, it's not complete in terms of size, but it, it's got some... Um, yeah, more important works over here. So this GCN has really started with a seminal paper by Takahu and Max Welling on discrete group convolution. So they proposed this GCN framework for discrete groups. Uh, then you don't need to do interpolation and you have exact equivariance. And ever since then, there's been uh, adaptations and extensions of this method for continuous groups. So first it was about uh, going to larger discrete groups, for example, 3D right angle <coughs> rotations, even methods that instead of working with a, a regular pixel grid, use a hexagonal grid, such that you can use uh, 
um, rotations over uh, two pi over six. Uh, so you can use you can, can increase the discrete group. So that this is actually nice. It's sort of a honeycomb uh, structure for the, for the pixels. Um, but there's also a method that focuses then on um, continuous rotation groups via continuous parameterizations of the convolution kernel. If you expect, express your kernel as a continuous function, let's say by a B splice or maybe even as an MLP, a, a neural network, then you can rotate it. And yeah, well, you can, it's just a matter of resampling this continuous function. So you can build uh, rotate translations for SE2 fully uh, or discretizations of this. And there's a method that extends this to the 3D case. And this is where steerability comes in or Fourier tree theory on the sphere. And maybe I'll get there. And then there's methods working on extending this to league groups. League groups is a very large class of groups that have a manifold structure to them. Um, so that's really a large class of groups. And then there's uh, recent methods focusing on gauge equivalent CNNs. And maybe tomorrow with the talk of Stefan, we will see something about it. I'm not, not sure, but the title suggested it. But this is actually really um, formalizing the idea of local uh, equivalence by working with gauge frames and uh, describing the local neighborhoods in terms of reference uh, frames. Um, yeah, so this is sort of what's, what's happening in the field. And there's a lot of interesting stuff going on with extension also to graph theory and, and meshes and other type of uh, manifold structures. Um, oh yeah, I want to show you some, some recent work. So this is uh, a method for constructing GCNNs by uh, uh, on lead groups where we can exploit the notion of the exponential and logarithmic map. Um, I don't think it makes sense to go into detail here, but you can apply this also to signal data, for example. And recently we applied it to molecular data as well. Uh, where we really have clear physical constraints, like these point clouds of atoms. You know, it's still the same atom or molecule if I rotate the entire point cloud. And uh, tasks such as property prediction, um, they should be invariant to these transformations. And in these methods, what we do, we work with a steerable method. Um, I think it's best if I do that later on when I explain a bit more notions of, of good theory for representation theory. Um, but yeah, so group convolutions can come in many uh, forms. Um, yeah, and the main idea is that GCNs are just neural networks. It's just uh, a linear layer followed by nonlinear activation function and then repeat, repeat, repeat. So actually GCNs are a special class of neural networks that are constrained to be equivariant. And that is what I'm going to talk about in the next part is that um, if we want to build a neural network and we want it to be equivariant, then it has to be a GCNN, a group convolutional neural network. So you can prove this. So it is all the same class of neural networks. It's just as these GCNNs are, but are constrained to be equivariant. Yeah, and the theorem is a linear map is equivariant if and only if it is a group convolution. Yeah, maybe I'd like a quick uh, break again. Um, are there any questions? Uh, or otherwise, you, you can approach me. Yeah, so let's take a quick break. The next part, um, I will make a theoretical statement um, that formalizes this, this sentence, group convolutions are all you need. And I approach this in, in this way. Like I, I mentioned before, that all these architectures are just instances of neural networks. It's just that they're constrained to be equivalent. And you want, of course, equivalence because then you preserve the structure of the data. You know, classically in this metric experiment, we have these endless images. Uh, you could flatten them into a vector, like um, I would treat it as a function, a discretized function of, which was actually a continuous function. But let's say you are naive deep learning and only know about neural networks, you just flatten this, turn this into a vector, and then apply a fully connected neural network layer. So these neural networks, they transform vectors in another vector, in another vector via transformations of the form like this, a matrix vector multiplication. So that is a linear transformation of uh, a finite dimensional vector. It spits out a new vector. You add a bias, another vector, and then you do an element-wise activation function like rather, and you iterate this. So what you're doing, you transform a vector iteratively in another vector. And at some point you say, okay, this vector represents a discrete probability uh, distribution. Um, and of course, this is a silly thing to do to image data because 
after this first layer, the data structure is completely lost. There's no notion anymore of neighborhoods for these kind of pixels that have anything to do with, with these images. Uh, well, because you connect every point to every other point. So what we're looking for is the equivalent, the continuous counterpart of these neural networks. So here the data are vectors in Rn and the linear operators are matrices, matrix vector multiplication. In the continuous case, uh, my data structures are signals or in an numerical setting, setting sampled signals so discretized on the grid. But from a mathematical point of view, this is a function that assigns to every pixel location a feature value. And we want to keep the same structure, which is as follows. We apply a linear transformation to a signal, add a vector to it, because these could be multi-channel uh, signals. Um, and didn't detail that, but everything is now done on scalar valued signals and but then generalized to vector values. The idea is we have a signal, you apply a linear transformation, a vector, and again, a pointwise activation function. Now, what is a linear operator on signals? Um, there's this Dunford Pettis Pat uh, result theorem that states that any linear map between function spaces, and this linear map is bounded. Uh, that's maybe a technical detail, but the idea is that linear maps in general between signals are kernel operators, are these uh, integral transforms. I hope you can see it, um, but it's, yeah, can you see it actually? It's, uh, it's the bottom of the slide. <laughs> um, so I, I show it over here. So the integral transform is the integration <coughs> Can I move it up? <laughs> okay. Um, maybe it will become clear in the next slide. It's a bit bigger. So this is a general linear transformation of a feature map. It's an integral transform of a two argument kernel that uh, integrates over the domain X for every possible Y value. So we have this, uh, this kernel that defines this integral transform. So you see it's the continuous counterpart of matrix vector multiplication. With matrix, you're, you're, you're working with finite dimensional vectors. So the elements of, in the vectors are indexed with some, some, some index. Um, and then the linear transformation is a summation, yeah, a row vector multiplication, row vector multiplication, and that generates the elements of your output vector. It's the same in, in the continuous settings. However, now I work with infinite dimensional vectors. So functions are again vectors because I can add them and you have scalar multiplication. It's just that these infinite dimensional vectors are indexed with continuous coordinates. Um, so then this continuous kernel operator is, is like a matrix vector multiplication where, um, yeah, instead of summing over your input indices, the x coordinate you integrate over it. So that's how you could maybe think of a general linear transformation uh, for signal data. Um, okay, so, so that's the purpose. So we want to build layers of this form because that's the form that we're used to uh, in, in neural network uh, literature. And then this kernel is a linear operator that has to be this integral transform. So then we can state the following, and this is a technical uh, term that I will explain in the following slides, but I think I really like, like this. So the idea is we have a signal on some domain and this domain is technically called the homogeneous space of G. Um, so the, for now it's sufficient to know we have a kernel operator that maps one signal to the other. And we want this kernel to be equivariant, then um, this kernel has to be a group convolution of the following form. There's no other way. Um, if these domains are lower dimensional, so if I, for example, want to be equivalent to rotor translations, so there's a three dimensional group, but I want to stick with 2D images, I can do that. I can say, I only consider signals in the 2D plane, but I still want to be equivalent to rotor translations. Then this imposes a particular constraint, namely that the kernel has to be symmetric relative to the group that you leave out, that you do not want to compute. So, um, and this is what I'm going to explain in the, the next slide, these technical terms, because in these papers on um, group equivalent deep learning, uh, you'll encounter them and it's nice to get to know what it means. And, it really mathematical terms that have very clear intuitive meanings. First of all, we already discussed the notion of a group action, right? So a group action, here we consider it, we write it as this operator, uh, this O dot 
uh, it's an operator that takes a group element and a function on the domain X on which it acts and it spits out another element in this domain. So let's say X is the space of 2D points, then the group action just transforms this point and brings me to another place in my space. And it follows the group structure as follows, as discussed, it's a group action. And so it has to follow this group structure. Now then there's a notion of a transitive action. A transitive action means that any two points in my space can be connected via the action of this group. So if my space is a 2D plane and I consider the translation group, so I'm now asking the question, is the 2D plane a, uh, does, does the translation group act transitively on R2? And this is the case because I can move this point to another point and I can do this basically for all points in my space. I can pick one, let's say origin, and I can move it to every point in my space. So the group acts transitively on the space of 2D positions. Same for the rotor translation group. I'm just here representing it with an arrow, uh, which has some position and orientation. And I can rotor translate this. And this brings me to another point in space. And I can connect every other 2D coordinate with this origin via the action of the group. So the 2D plane is also acted upon transitively by the rotor translation. The group of rotations, however, it does act on R2 because we know how to rotate a 2D rotation vector. And uh, so you know it like this, so, but it creates this orbit. This is what you call an orbit. If you consider all possible group elements applied to X, you get circles, you get a rotation of this point. And clearly it doesn't cover the, the entire domain. So this action of SO2 does not, uh, so the group S2 does not act transitively on the 2D plane. Um, of course, we can connect another point, which creates another orbit, but obviously this point cannot be connected with just rotations uh, and so on. Okay, so that's transitive action. Um, why do we think it's important? Uh, so, okay, this is then a uh, final definition. A homogeneous space is a space of uh, a space X, so the onto go, a space X on which G X transitive. And this is a nice property of a space to have, because when we think of this, a uh, convolution as a template matching where we translate uh, the kernel. So we probe uh, the signal for a given template. Uh, we want every possible pattern to be detected. And if we only, um, let's say, move the kernel around with rotations relative to some point, yeah, you will never see the entire signal. So uh, generally, you want the domain of functions to be homogeneous as then um, every piece of information in the data can be seen via the group conversion. It's, it's like this, we want to probe the image for uh, all possible translations. And if I only consider rotations, yeah, you miss out on a lot of data and you have this arbitrary choice of orientation of what you want to rotate about. This is, I like this example. So this is the, the sphere S2, is a homogeneous space of SO3. And that's why, um, but in diffusion MRI, these kind of applications, a lot of these methods do rely on representation theory for the rotation, the 3D rotation. And I'm going to show it as follows that it is a homogeneous space by using the following parameterization. So let's say we have this plane and we have three rotation angles. Uh, first, the rotation around the x axis, then around the y axis, and then around the z axis. I can use different uh, parameterization. And I'm going to visualize it as, as follows. So I take a point on the sphere. Um, then we have a beta and gamma rotation, which maps to a different point on the sphere. And this alpha rotation around the axis, axis I represent it radially with a periodic axis. So this runs from zero to two pi uh, in this case. Uh, let's see what it looks like. So this is an object and we <coughs> rotate it. So um, at the start, I will rotate around the alpha axis and I represent it with this uh, point uh, on this radial axis, it just looks like this, right? So now I'm rotating it. Oh, okay, let's, let's skip that. <laughs> so the idea is that an SO3 rotation, I can maybe visualize it as this, as a point somewhere in this volume. Um, but if my object has a certain symmetry in it, then uh, these rotations uh, do not, uh, rotation around the alpha axis does not change the object. So it's invariant to that representation. And therefore, every point on this fiber attached to each point on the sphere is identified with the one and the same object. Um, um, 
actually what I'm talking about now is a, is a quotient space. <laughs> so this isn't a good as a quotient space. Um, but the point is, first of all, that any point on the sphere, uh, it's, it's a low dimensional space of SO3, can be reached with an action of uh, the rotation group. So, this, so then we get to the, the set of a quotient space. And this quotient space, I'll define it as such, is the, the space of unique cosets G, H, where this is defined as taking a subset H, so a subgroup of rotations, for example, and I move it around my space. And that creates these fibers. Right? If I have a point over here and I apply an alpha rotation, I just move along this axis and I say I identify it with, with the same coset. So um, I can pick two, two group elements in H that bring me to a different point on this fiber. And I'll just say, okay, they belong in the same fiber. So I'll just treat them uh, as the same. And so this means every such fiber can be identified with a point on the sphere. So we can think of quotient spaces as lower dimensional uh, sets on which you group X uh, transitively. So the sphere is a homogeneous space of SO3, and it can be modeled as a quotient space of SO3 with SO2 factor drive. Uh, finally, <laughs> and this is related then, is the notion of a stabilizer. The stabilizer is a subset of G that leaves some point on, on the, the space on which GX invariant. Right, so the stabilizer of X zero are all the group elements for which G acting on X zero keeps it fixed. Um, so, okay, I should have maybe visualized this cone over here, but if you rotate it, um, it fixes uh, this, this axis, for example. So we can model the sphere as to a quotient space of SO3 with H, the stabilizer of the origin EX, because it doesn't move, does, it doesn't move away from EX. Now, then, then you can, this is, this is just a different way of looking at it. So a homogeneous space, I can call it a quotient space by the relations that I saw before. Um, and any homogeneous space, so a space in which the group expands differently, I can think of it as a quotient space with some subgroup H. Um, yeah, maybe let's go over this example. So this is also from the lecture notes. So we consider the 2D or the D-dimensional plane is a quotient space, which I can identify with SED with rotations factored out. And so where H then is the group of no translations with all possible uh, rotations uh, SOD. Um, and the cosets GH are then given by the sets of all possible G um, being applied to all possible sub elements of my group SOD. So this is a set of all rotations um, yeah, relative to this, this group uh, element, which I'm considering at the moment. So if you write it out, it's like this. So the group R, oh, zero is now replaced with identity element E. Um, yeah, so rotations apply to the origin, um, brings you back to the zero vector, right? Rotation applies to the zero vector, zero vector. So this one disappears. And what I'm left with is this. So all possible rotation matrices, so R was in G, apply to all possible rotation in uh, R tilde. So that's still the full rotation group. It's just a relative, other different relative rotation. So the set as a set is left unchanged. So that means these cosets are actually sets described as follows. So they have an X parameter and then all uh, rotations in SOD. So you see that these cosets, they are uniquely identified or let's say indexed by the factor X and X was a factor in RD. So instead of taking them as so in a coset, the elements are actually these subgroups. So collection of group elements that I say, these are the same. Um, but in a, a homogeneous space, we just say, okay, the homogeneous space consists of elements, let's say position vectors. And you can say, you can talk of them in different ways. So you can either say, okay, um, I treat the quotient set as, as the space RD, or I can treat this as a collection of, of cosets. Um, yeah. Okay, so now we can interpret, interpret this theorem uh, again. So, um, yeah, so the idea is that we're looking at signals between homogeneous spaces. Um, 
you can prove by transitivity of the group product and the equivalence constraint. Wait, did I say that? Uh, Oh, yeah, if k is equivalent, then it has to be uh, a group convolution. The proof is in, in the lecture notes if you're interested in that. And this is a result, a consequence actually of this quotient structure um, where you want to be invariant uh, because the domain is an identifier for this coset. And every element or response in this coset should be treated the same. And that means that actions of H in the subgroup applied to the kernel should well, result in the, the same kernel. Um, yeah, so, so that is what, what it says. Okay. So what you would then have, you have several cases. So either you can choose to stick with these low, lower dimensional signals, but that would mean you have a constraint on the kernel. For example, if you want to build networks that are equivalent to rotations and translations, you can do that with 2D convolutions, but then your convolution kernels should be isotropic. That's, that's a result of this uh, item two. Okay, <laughs> that's unnecessary. Um, and then we have the lifting convolution, as we saw before. If you have a signal on the 2D plane, we can lift it to the group. Uh, both are homogeneous spaces. Um, and then there are no constraints on, on the kernel K. The same for group convolutions. But we can also project it backwards uh, or down from a group to this lower dimensional plane. Um, what this actually corresponds, because these, all these equivalent layers are integral transformed. You can show that this should be a mean pooling uh, operation in, in this context. And then global pooling sort of maps to, to an empty uh, set to just a scalar value. And this is a bit sloppy notation because, yeah, can you call it a, a group or a homogeneous space? Uh, I'm not really sure actually. Um, yeah, actually, th th this is what I already discussed. And so these are the three cases. We either go from image to image, with just a conclusion of the and the then the kernel is uh, invariant, it should be rotation invariant, or we can lift it to, uh, to the group and then we have no constraints on the group convolution kernels. So this also suggests that the most expressive group equivalent egg architectures are obtained by lifting the signals to the group, right? Because then there are no constraints on the kernels. So again, I can build group equivalent method with just 2D convolutions, but then the kernels have to be isotropic and that significantly constrains the representation power of the neural network. And hence we always use equivalent layers as much as possible as to increase the representation power of these neural networks. Um, so the implications of this theorem are uh, twofold. One is uh, if you want equivalence, which you usually want because you want to guarantee these geometric uh, properties, then you need to use group convolutions. So that's one. And the second thing, if you want this network to be expressive as possible, you want to lift it to, uh, to the group itself. Okay. Um, yeah, then I have half an hour left to go with steerable group convolutions. So it has been, uh, yeah, maybe for now, are there questions? Okay. Uh, then we'll, we'll just continue. We already touched upon several cases of um, questions on numerical implementations. And this isn't not always an issue. I mean, people take numerical discretization artifacts for granted quite often. And especially in deep learning, you can always sort of assume, okay, the learning framework sort of learns how to deal with these artifacts. Uh, but in particular cases, it also learns how to exploit these artifacts as to break equivariance. And um, so you want to prevent that. And now steerable methods are a way to prevent this discretization artifacts. So this maybe summarizes this. First of all, the steerable methods are typically defined for transformations that involve rotations. There is theory that extends this to other types of transformations, but that's um, really hard. Uh, but for SO3, SO2, this is very well understood. Okay, and it's based on a Fourier convolution theorem on SO3. So it avoids discretization, um, so by which you can actually uh, obtain exact equivalence to these rotations. Whereas previously, these discretizations, you can only state that the networks are equivalent to a subgroup of rotations, for example, 90 degree rotations, but not 45 degree uh, sub rotations. Um, but then finally, this viewpoint of steerable methods, it provides a roadmap to equivalence on, on 
yeah, I write arbitrary, but it should be maybe Riemannian manifolds uh, via gauge theory. Um, because as we will see, instead of lifting, so far with the regular group convolution, we lifted the domain from a, let's say, 2D plane to the high dimensional group. So we lifted the domain of the function. With steerable method, you think of it differently. You not extend the domain, but you extend the co-domain. You attach to every point in your plane a fiber, which represents a signal on the sphere, actually. And by that, they're in equi equivalent, so the regular and the steerable group convolutions. Uh, yeah, I'll show that in a minute. Uh, but that's the idea that you extend the code domain with more abstract things than vectors. And in a recent method, which is going to be published soon, um, at least on archive, I hope it passes the, neuro the neuro reviews. <laughs> it's, um, we apply these kind of methods for molecular data, right? Because um, there, obviously, we also want equivalence or invariance because the atomic point cloud, if you rotate it, it still represents the same molecule. And it should therefore still have the same property. Um, but the nasty thing about point clouds is, is that you don't have this nice discrete grid on which the data lives. You can, you should be able to expect every possible relative position vector. So you really should treat this in a continuous setting. And that's what we do in this method. So we treat this as a point clouds on, on RD, but then build group convolution methods, actually a nonlinear adaptation of group convolutions. That works with these steerable vectors that encode for directional information. Um, yeah, and if the, the molecule rotates, these directional cues of information rotate accordingly. Um, yeah, so we apply this in this case for this in this open catalyst project. It's a challenge to discover new uh, catalysts. So it's a really nice uh, initiative, I think, with the, with the purpose of. Um, storage of renew renewable energy, right? If you have solar panels and you cannot use the energy, you want to store it on some way. And this can be done with, uh, with let's say, hydrogen at a, uh, batteries that turn water into hydrogen uh, and oxygen, uh, but they rely on catalysts. And we want to be able to discover new catalysts. So we want to explore all sorts of materials. And you can do this in a graph convolutional setting, uh, which we now uh, treat in an equivalent way. So that's a bit for the motivation, and of course, yeah, <laughs> we beat the, the, the state of the art on a particular task of you um, by really exploiting the geometric structure and, and yeah, what we think of proper way. So we use equivalent tools uh, to do this, and these same tools could also be applied to a uh, diffusion MRI data, uh, where you also have uh, so where you want maybe equivalence to rotations and translations, and the data structure is you have a spherical distribution at every voxel in your data. Um, so the roadmap is as follows. So I'm going to again go big, bit back to uh, representation theory. So it's like what irreducible for representations, and then show that straight harmonics and the D matrices are irreducible for representations. Um, this allows us to define a Fourier transformer as a tree. It allows us then to define a convolution theorem. And so through the convolution theorem and actually to the clebsch gordon tensor product, it's a way of combining uh, representations. Uh, we obtain steerable uh, GCNs. So the idea is as follows. So we've encountered representations now several times. So a representation is just, uh, yeah, which we may call a homomorphism of the group to some other operator. And any two matrix representations, or this is specific for matrix representations, but uh, for representation in general, are called equi <laughs> equivalents. So not to be confused with equivalent, but equivalents, so they can be treated the same if they relate via similarity transform. And that, that should really be interpreted as this uh, matrix representation, representation acts on a vector space. And yeah, I can choose whatever basis I can have on this uh, vector space. And Q uh, then should be considered a change of basis, which makes these two representations equivalent. Then you have this idea of reducibility of matrix representations. So if they are, if they if they're, they're excess, ex equivalent representations, we can also apply a diagonalization procedure that uh, consider this um, matrix representations. We can diagonalize it, maybe to, to this block diagonal form, uh, where along uh, these, these, these blocks themselves are again representations because they act on well, a smaller uh, vector space, which brings us again to that small vector space. Um, so this is this. Diagonalization procedure, you can derive reducible 
or irreducible representation, because if you apply this, apply it, and at some point you can no longer turn this matrix, for example, again in a block diagonal form with, with zeros uh, on the off diagonals, you came to a representation which can no longer be reduced. So that's like the canonical or yeah, the, what you call the irreducible representations. And so this is terminology, uh, but I wanted to mention this because you encountered this a lot of these papers talk about irreducible representations. Now, weight and D matrices are what you call the irreducible matrix representations of S or T. So if I have a matrix that acts as a rotation on some vector space, so it has this property that um, it is a representation, then we can always block diagonalize it into uh, this matrix along the diagonal where we have uh, Wigner D matrices. Okay. And yeah, okay, so, so let's say the every representation of SO3 can be decomposed into irreducible representations. Yeah, okay, so then the Wigner D matrices are defined to be the irreducible matrix representation of SO3, and they are of dimension 2L plus 1, where L uh, uh, square, by the way where L is, can be considered as a frequency index. And this relates them also to spherical harmonics, as we will see soon. But these Wigner D matrices, they generalize the notion of a rotation matrix for the rotation of two L plus one dimensional vectors. So we already know Wigner D, D matrices in the form of the standard three by three rotation matrix, matrices that act on the 3D space. But this shows that there exists also rotation matrices of higher dimension that transform five dimensional vectors or seven dimensional vectors, et cetera. And um, so that's how you should think of D. D is with some frequency index or order or degree um, represents a rotation matrix on a space that does not have to be three dimensional space but can be higher dimensional. And this is just a the terminology then the elements of these rotation matrices, for example, the cosines and sines that you see in these rotation matrices these are called uh, the Wigner D functions. And then finally, <laughs> uh, what we call a steerable vector space um, is just a vector space of dimension 2L plus 1, which is acted upon by these Wigner D matrices. So the three dimensional space, R3, we call it a, a type 1 steerable vector space for LS1, um, but we can also have a five dimensional vector space. Uh, yeah, on which we, there's a Wigner D matrix with the X on it. And it's just convenience to show, okay, we treat these elements as stable vectors. So meaning there is a Wigner D matrix yeah, defined for it. You may have encountered Wigner D matrices uh, in the form, uh, in the context of spherical harmonics. So I want to say a bit about spherical harmonics. So first of all, these are functions on the sphere, which is represented as follows. Um, color indicates, uh, positive or negative values. So blue is, I guess, positive, uh, yellow negative. And here they are scaled in that direction. So in this direction, I have a large negative value and this direction I have a positive value. And in this orthogonal direction, it has the value zero. So that's, this is a glyph visualization of a function on the sphere. Um, they are solution to, uh, solution to Laplace equations. So uh, solutions to Laplace equations are called harmonics, and these are harmonics constrained to the sphere. So hence the name spherical harmonics. And you can think of them as the spherical equivalent of the circular harmonics, which you uh, may have encountered in, in signal uh, processing theory, uh, the, the one dimensional uh, Fourier basis, or uh, yeah, which has frequency indices as well, right? So we have a frequency number that just fits in this interval zero to pi, and then we have the next frequency, so um, the, the L that we saw before, that's what you can think of as a frequency index for, index for these weight the matrices. And also, so these spherical harmonics are indexed by uh, such an L. Now, from this representation point of view, these spherical harmonics, they are actually um, the, the central column of these rotation matrices. So if you have a three-dimensional rotation matrix for L is one, for example, the central column defines spherical harmonics. So that's uh, maybe up to some scaling factor that they are equivalent. Um, and this then directly tells us that these spherical harmonic functions, they are steerable by Wigner D matrix because they are the columns, they are one particular column of such a matrix. It's visualized as, as follows. So why is 
uh, spherical harmonic uh, vector. We will indicate maybe often a tilde above a vector to indicate that it's a steerable vector. But if I sample this set of spherical harmonic functions at a particular point, I create a vector. And this vector is acted upon by this Wigner D matrices of some degree. Like the zeroth order spherical harmonic is a function that is invariant on the sphere. And therefore, um, yeah, a, a rotation is just the scalar number itself. It doesn't do anything. If I sample the first frequency order of spherical harmonics, I get three functions, which I should treat as one three dimensional vector and it's uh, transformed by the rotation matrix. And then the second set of spherical harmonics, <coughs> so those are five values, that gives me a five dimensional value. This is actually a one with a, a rotation matrix of, of uh, frequency two or degree two. Um, yeah, it's visualized as such. So if I project this point, if I treat this uh, direction as a function on the sphere, let's say Dirac delta, which is one only at that point or zero otherwise, then uh, sampling it on the spherical harmonic, this gives me a function that sort of tries to approximate this Dirac delta and the higher frequency you get, the sharper it gets. And this representation, it rotates via, um, yeah, via these uh, Wigner D matrices. So, okay, that, that's it, that's representation theory on the sphere. And so I'm, I'm mainly saying, talking about this to, to get at least you a bit acquainted with this terminology that if you see this in literature that you know what people are talking about. So similar that to the fact that these uh, harmonics form an orthonormal, orthonormal basis on um, the ring, for example, in the Fourier theory, which, which you see before, these spherical harmonics, they form uh, a basis on the space of functions on S2. And this basis is orthonormal, so these coefficients can be obtained directly with just an inner product of uh, the underlying signal with this basis function. And that gives you a, fact, a vector of coefficients for every frequency number. Yeah, so in the, the, the one dimensional case, you would get one complex number or a two dimensional vector, but let's say one number, uh, but now we get a full vector for every frequency and this vector increases in size with higher frequencies. And then we can also have an inverse Fourier transform uh, by expanding it again in, in the basis. And the same holds for functions on SO3. So these elements of these Wigner D matrices, they're all orthogonal functions. Um, they can be used to expand a function on the group SO3 as a tree, sorry, type of there. Um, again, by the exact same structure. So the Fourier transform on the group gives you um, matrix values coefficients because these weighted ma D matrices are matrices. So the Fourier coefficients say are matrices instead of scalar numbers. Um, and this trace stuff is just a fancy way of summing over these different uh, basis functions with the corresponding uh, coefficients. Yeah, I can imagine that this is maybe um, a bit too much at this point, but if you have any questions, uh, please, please ask them. <laughs> the main point is that now we have Fourier theory on groups, on, on SOD specifically, SO3, what we call it here. And that also means we have nice uh, results that also, that, that are also derived from the case where you're familiar with. Namely, that that's the shift property that if I I rotate my input signal, it just corresponds with the multiplication of each of the coefficients with the corresponding representation or the corresponding Wigner D matrix. And this is nice. Um, but most importantly, there's this convolution theorem on SO3. So did, let the star be a group convolution or group correlation. Then the, the Fourier transform of such a group correlation is obtained by multiplying these matrix coefficients of these uh, signals. So that means that we can do convolution in the Fourier domain. And that also means since there's no um, group indexing here going on at, at all, these are just the coefficients, that means these convolutions can be computed exactly. So because this is an analytic descriptor of the underlying signal. Um, okay, and so that's what it's all about. So we have the group convolution theorem on SO3, and so we can build group convolutions. And Oh, yeah, then finally, I want to just quickly show something called the Klebsch-Gordon tensor product. If you have a steerable vector, or let's say the tensor product between vectors generally can be written as follows, right? It multiplies make all possible combinations of multiplications and store it in, in an array. Now, for steerable, we're now working with steerable vectors and we want the output to also be steerable. 
and you can show that this is an EPK. So actually, one is actually variant. So if I take a tensor product between two steer wall vector, which spits out another vector, uh, we want uh, there to exist a rotation matrix also on this space. Um, so that it corresponds to if I rotate the input and the output you rotate accordingly. You can derive what this looks like by, uh, um, by these factorization procedures. Uh, maybe it's getting a bit too boring to explain this, but the idea is you can show that if I have a rotation on the inputs um, and then apply this tensor product, this induces a rotation on the output by a matrix that looks like this. And since we have this result of um, uh, um, reducibility of matrix representations, this is a matrix representation. We can reduce this again to block diagonal form with Wigner D matrices along the diagonal. And that's what the collapse Gordon product does. So instead of com computing this rotation matrix and then diagonalizing, the collapse Gordon product does this directly uh, for you. Um, so such that the result of the tensor product will be a vector in the space of uh, which contains seeable vectors of type zero, type one, etc., which each individually transform via their corresponding rotation matrix. Um, yeah, okay, so this is in the definition and it's defined by these collapse coordinate uh, coefficients. But the idea is the output of a collapse coordinate tensor product is again a steerable vector. So now we can build steerable neural networks with this. Um, you do that for spherical data, for example, maybe for diffusion MRI data. We already introduced the, the convenience for molecular data. Um, so in this case, the group which you want to be equivalent to is the group of SO3. Uh, transformations, and in this case, we want to be equivalent to SE3 uh, rotor translations. Yes. Yes, I was trying to pay attention to the slide before on your last screen. So, can you really state what is the steerable uh, vector? Just oh yeah, yeah, go back to the slide you were at now. Just say again. Oh, okay. What is the steerable? No, yeah. So a steerable vector is really a vector which is which which I can rotate with a Wigner D matrix. That's it. So I call it a steerable vector because then I directly know I'm talking about vectors which I can rotate via these vector matrices. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So there are two cases, and I will quickly go over the SO3 case to show that we can derive except group convolutions on the sphere of on, on SO3. And the, the idea is as follows: We're going to build spherical CNNs by convolutions in the Fourier domain. So Initially, we saw, okay, we want to build networks with linear layers that are equivalent, and hence they should be group convolutions. Now I'm going to just apply these group convolutions in the Fourier domain as follows, which will be just a multiplication of the coefficients of the, the input signal with some kernel, uh, the coefficients of the kernel. And actually switching to the notation of K will be W. So these are the weights that parameterize this layer. And I'm going to do another trick is I'm going to treat this in vectorized form because these coefficients are in general matrix valued, right? For every frequency, you have a matrix of uh, Fourier coefficients. I'm just going to flatten this into one big vector with this factorization operator. And then there's these uh, identities that you can use for vectorization that basically tells that this is the same as this. So we have a vectorization of the input signal. So this matrix, let's say a three by three coefficient matrix for type one. It's flattened into a nine dimensional vector. And um, the convolution is then performed by this uh, blob diagonal, uh, or this, this, this tensor product. It's not blob diagonal, it's identity in the right. But let's consider the special case of only considering functions which contain frequency one to, to keep the analysis simple. simple. Frequency one means that um, the Fourier coefficients. Uh, in the spherical harmonic case, are three dimensional vectors. Um, actually, that is indicated over here. So, <laughs> sorry for the confusing. So, F hat is the matrix, uh, the, the, are the matrix coefficients of a function on SO3. But if my function is a function on the sphere, then many of these coefficients are actually zero. And we only keep this central column, namely the spherical harmonics. This is the first column of. Uh, the, the coefficient matrix is the central column, and this is the second column. And for spherical harmonics, only the central column uh, has values. Okay, so for functions on the sphere, I only have to focus on this part. So a function on the sphere is represented by this three dimensional vector. So then convolution is described in the following form. So what I did here, I just expanded this, uh, this product over here. 
Um, okay, so if I want to perform convolutions, namely um, the output is again a steerable uh, vector of, of type one in this case. There's nine coefficients, so there's the first column, second column, third column is obtained in this way. But because these are zero, I don't have to pay attention to these weights that in principle could parameterize a full function on, on SO3. But since these are zero, I don't have to care about this, which means that if my input data is a function on the sphere, a spheric harmonic, then my kernel is also a spheric harmonic. And that, I mean, that makes sense, right? If you do a convolution, you want the two objects to be at the same time. Okay, so you convolve a spheric harmonic with a spheric harmonic. Um, but you also see that the result will generally be a nine dimensional vector and not a function on the sphere. So the result will be a function on SO3. Uh, but if you want the result also to be a function on the sphere, um, then uh, we want these values to be zero. And it means that we also don't care about these weights, we set them to zero. And then it means that these convolutions are parameterized with just one value per frequency uh, that is. Um, and if you look at the spheric harmonic functions, uh, I should have included them here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, these are the central elements of these Whitney D matrices. And you see these are indeed isotropic relative to this vertical axis. So that means these convolution kernels that only contain of these elements, um, yeah, they are indeed functional sphere, which, is, which are isotropic. And this is again a consequence of theorem one, which says if we want to work with homogeneous spaces, such as the sphere, but once we equivalent to the full group, well, then we need a symmetry constraint of the kernels. And we just saw that this is indeed the case uh, that we are only going to use these spherical harmonic functions. Um, yeah, and that, that's, that's again expressed in, in, in this case. Um, if you have a function, or if you do template matching, and this is visualizing a, a, a kernel on the sphere, localized kernel, um, if I translate it to a certain point, for example, to the North Pole, I can do this in several ways. And if I do it like this, it is aligned like this. We have this blue blob on this side. But if I translate it in the other direction and put it, make it, bring it to that point, uh, this blue blob is on this side. So there's this ambiguity of how you rotate it and move your template to the North Pole, uh, which actually already tells you then that you can only work with isotropic uh, convolution filters. Um, so that's one case, or, so that's what we just saw, or you lift it to the full group. So at this point, you have to consider all possible rotations of this film. And that's the most general case. Um, and then, um, yeah, these blue values also take value and you generate a function on the sphere. So an unconstrained spherical harmonic kernel generates a function on the full group SO3. And that's similar to what we have seen before. If you want to use the most expressive group convolutions, uh, you want to lift it to the full group. And that's again what we see here. And then finally, full group convolutions are parameterized by this, by this full dense, uh, uh, in this case, three by three uh, matrices of, of weights, because then the signal has these nine um, coefficients and the output signal also is again, a Fourier uh, signal with nine coefficients per frequency or for frequency one at least. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so that you can use it to build group conclusion on networks. And I finally to wrap up, and I will not go into detail here. I just want to mention that uh, previously I we constructed SO3 equivalent neural networks using the Fourier theorem, uh, but we have another operator that we can use to, to manipulate steerable vectors. That's the Gletsch Gordon tensor product. And they are uh, usually defined as follows. So at each location, I have a steerable vector represented here as spheric harmonics. And then the convolution is again, spits out a steerable vector. And this convolution takes the Gletsch Gordon product of this feature vector at each node and multiplies them with the spheric harmonic vector that encodes a relative position. Um, and it's parameterized by, by a weight or by a bunch of weights. And it relates to regular group convolutions by saying that uh, if my kernel is expanded in a spherical harmonic basis, so it has this angular dependency and it has some radial dependency. So, and this is uh, the lifting convolution case, by the way. Um, yeah, th then, then it is a regular convolution, group convolution is exactly the same as a steerable group convolution. I just wanted to, sh to show that, that if people talk about steerable group convolutions, 
yeah, they're, they're actually one and the same to regular group conclusions. Um, there are some modifications, but I'm not going to explain that. And so this kernel, it has a spatial part and an angular part. And also this clash column product has a spatial part and this angular part that sort of you can use to identify the, the two cases. And the main difference then um, between these two methods is that regular group convolutions, as saw before, transform feature maps on homogeneous spaces. For example, um, diffusion MRI-like data, which is assigned to every translation and every well uh, rotation in, in the sphere or every point, every direction, a feature value. Feature steerable methods, they assign to every 3D location a steerable feature vector like this. For every location assigned a steerable feature vector. Um, so this led us to change a few points, and there are some directions for generalization, which I'm not covering here in this talk, but that sort of <coughs> indicates the context of steerable group convolutions. Um, finally, I want to really um, applaud the authors of these, these, these uh, libraries. So there's this very decent uh, E2 CNN library for group convolutions on 2D planes. Um, both steerable and regular group convolutions um, from which I actually borrowed this figure. So this uh, repository is maintained by Gabriele Cesar and Maurice Weiler. And so they implement, implement basically everything you need for group convolutions. And then this for three-dimensional data structure, focusing mostly on point clouds and spherical functions is the E3NN library. Uh, so we use it a lot in our latest experiments. Um, I think Mario Geiger is the person that the, uh, maybe maintains this, and he did a great job. Everything you need, like uh, Klebsch Gordon products, um, linear layers for uh, spheric harmonic functions, it's all implemented there, and you can build your neural networks with it. And then there's an, a three dimensional version of E2 CNN coming up soon. Um, you please keep track of the work of uh, Gabriel Cesar, who uh, also is the author of this library. Um, basically, everything you need for 3D stable group conclusions. Um, and actually, this afternoon, I really encourage you to play around with this library. So uh, one of my PhD <coughs> students, Rob Hesseling, who is also here today, he made a nice uh, collab notebook. Uh, maybe you can uh, wave. There he is. <laughs> OK. Um, yeah, we will walk around this afternoon. But uh, you can get started maybe with a 3D demo for molecular data and see how you can connect it to your own applications. Uh, or you can play around with a 2D uh, collab notebook, which uh, Gabriel Cesar, the author of this library, provided as an exercise to actually implement your own group conclusions, which is nice as an exercise, but obviously there's no need because there's this very elaborate library that does this for you. So in conclusions, uh, in conclusion, so we have this theorem that says that GC NANs naturally arise from neural networks under when you put them under equivariance constraints. So if you consider equivariance, you should use uh, GC Um they make data augmentation obsolete with the remark that with data augmentation, I mean transformations that are included in the group that you consider. Data augmentations are always useful, but not if the geometric transformations that you use for data augmentations are covered by a group. Um, they work well because no valuable network capacity needs to be spent on learning geometric structure. Um, and the added geometric structure allows you to deal with context, and this sort of motivates why they work better in the sense of representation power, because they can now define features in terms of relative positions and rotations or relative transformations. Um, okay, that's this recognition by component viewpoint that we saw. Um, yeah, experimentally, we saw that uh, with this GCNS, we can achieve performances that cannot be achieved with data augmentation alone. And we really did a lot of work on different applications where we really tweaked two DCNNs to the, the, the best we can, and then, uh, did the same for GCNNs and always GCNNs perform much better than the, the 2D CNNs. And it makes sense, hopefully, also to you, given the story that I, I just told. And they guarantee geometric stability to these transformations. And they can be applied to many types of signals, like spherical data, point clouds, um, also to data searches, which are not covered today. And then the equivalence extended to, to Lie groups in general, or gauge equivalence for manifolds or mesh uh, data. Um, yeah, and with that, I would like uh, to end. So thank you all for...